glad and honored to have both Pastors Phil and Gina Crandall in the house today. Um, again, these are our covering pastors. One of our uh, key scriptures for our men's ministry is found in 1 Kings 19 and re recited in Romans 11 about Elijah getting real with God and saying, man, I, I've done your work. I'll do your word. I'll tell it, but I just don't want to do it alone anymore. It's him just being real as a man unto God. And, and God answered and said, I've got 7,000 that have not bent their knee to Baal. I've not kissed him with their lips. And we are not alone is what God was saying to Elijah. And he began to see that in his life and work with another man called Elisha and, and see God continue to work and move. And when we began to, to contemplate whether or not we wanted to accept the role as lead pastors in this church, man, I, I said to my wife, I ain't doing it without you. We're either doing this together or I, we're, I'm not doing it. Uh, I'm not doing it. I'm content being a worship leader. We'll go somewhere else. And and uh, she's she's one to end up encouraging me and saying, I'm with you. I'm with you. We, I'm not behind you. I'm beside you. And I've called her on those words many times, saying, get up here and declare the word with me. And so we knew we weren't alone there, but we needed even more than that. We have a covering. And, and I thank God for these, these people. And we don't have to do it alone. We have leadership in this house. We have a body of believers in this house that are coming alongside us. And, and we're building the kingdom as God leads us in this church. But we have a covering. And I thank God for these people that I can call. Like you may want to call me or my parents sometime in the middle of the night. And all these things that I know I can call them. I've been corrected by them. Not enjoyable. But I've been guided by them so many more times than corrected. And... I've seen their heart. I felt their embrace. They've picked up our tears, and, and we've seen theirs as they went through seasons. And their example is so, so good. They're great preachers, great leaders, but their example and their love is what keeps me going and guides us and pushes us, pushes us, leads us. And my parents came under their covering, and, and we do as well. And so would you stand to your feet? I could go on and on, but I just want to honor and welcome them to the pulpit today. Amen. Let's welcome Pastors Phil and Gina Crandall. Woo! Amen. Are we live? Amen. Praise the Lord. Could we give my wife a good hand? Woo! Honey, God bless you, sweetheart. <laughs> Amen. Oh, man, that's good preaching, Pastor Matt. That's good preaching. Praise the Lord. You know, at the, uh, at the night of the phone call that I received from my father, very, very unexpectedly, not only did he tell us he was resigning the church uh, that night, the elders, nobody else knew. Nobody knew, but uh, uh, Dad was that kind of a man. When God spoke to him, you know, he didn't... Uh, he didn't hesitate, not, not one minute, not one minute. But I got off the phone and uh, looked as white as a sheet of paper. And uh, my wife goes, what in the world is wrong? What was said? I said, Dad's residing in the church tonight. And she said, yeah, well, who's going to pastor? And I said, we are. <laughs> she said, you are? I said, no, ma'am, we are. <laughs> but anyhow, praise the Lord. God bless you. Uh, if you could just uh, stand for one second. Um, I caught you, didn't I? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. But uh, Galatians chapter 3. I want to read just a couple of verses. Beginning in verse 22, it says, But the scripture hath concluded everyone under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith what should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, or because of, the law was our school, everybody say schoolmaster. 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 So the law of God is not a bad thing. It's not a terrible thing, as people uh, might believe. But the word says, but the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that, faith has come. We are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 27 says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. 
There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap for his word this morning. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God bless you. Just a, a, a comment. You may be seated, um, but just um, a quick introduction, quick introduction to the to the message this morning. But author unknown, author unknown, but um, I wrote something down um, along with this particular verse um, of scripture and paying close attention to verse 27. And that says, if, if you've been baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. I'd like to read this quote because it really is profound. It really is profound. It says, if there is any one fact doctrine, command, or promise in the Bible which has produced no practical effect on your temper, heart, or conduct, be assured you do not truly believe it. Wow. Wow. I'll let that sink in just for a second here this morning. But um, what a challenge. Uh, what a challenge when I read that for the first time. What a challenge to me when I came across that and thought, wow, um, I assume that I believe certain things. You know, we're always so quick to agree with the word. We're sometimes so quick to agree with, you know, the preaching of God's word. But, um, but when it really comes right down to it, we're going to be tested on what we truly have received into our hearts and what we truly do believe. God's going to make sure, come on now, and I heard Barbara Nichols say a lot of years ago, she said, God oftentimes will offend your mind to reveal what's truly in your heart. Yeah. And so God's going to prove his word in you. Uh, the word tells us that we should prove God's word in of ourselves. And God doesn't have a problem with you either proving him or proving his word. It's not that we doubt it, no, but we step out in faith and we really do. We command God to accomplish his word, his promises, praise God. And the word says that you can rightly do that, that you can come boldly before the throne of grace. Hallelujah. How many of you are, are, are happy this morning that not only should you feel welcomed, but no, you need to know in your heart that you've got a right. Come on now. Jesus Christ has given you the right. Come on now, you're an heir with, along with Abraham. Everybody say, Father Abraham. Father. Come on now. And so if surely Father Abraham had a, had a little clout with God. <laughs> Somebody say amen. But you know, as a believer, you're an heir with Abraham. You know, and as a joint heir with Jesus Christ, oh my goodness, come on now, you don't have to fear, but we welcome the presence and the power of God in our lives. Praise God. You know, over the weekend, uh, Friday evening, we shared a little word, kind of an introduction, and we began to share just a little bit about the difference between mercy and grace, for example. Uh, we began to share the difference that there is between the term justification and sanctification. And we spent the evening talking about the grace of God, a message entitled The Power of Grace. And uh, a lot of people don't even realize because uh, uh, maybe the misuse of grace in our society or the misuse of, of grace in, in many churches or among many church people, um, you know, and uh, just because something uh, is not rightly said or done initially doesn't mean that we need to just throw it out. You know, if I, if I have permission, Pastor, I'd like to, I'd like to say something uh, uh, that you told me a lot of years ago told me about the difference between your past and using the name of God. Is that, is that all right if I share that? But Brother Paul in a conversation told me a lot of years ago, and perhaps you've heard it, but it impacted me. I've never forgot it. I've, I've shared it practically. Your name comes up every year in the Bible college, every single year. But he shared with me in a telephone call, and he said, you know, Brother Phil, he said, there was a time in my life when I misused the name of God before I saved. I misused the name of God. So after I was saved, does that mean that I had no right to properly begin to use the name of God? Come on, is anybody out there? No, it means that when we are cleansed, when we are saved, when we are forgiven by God, come on now, we need to put away old things. We don't need to ask anybody to, to excuse us or forgive us. Come on, is anybody out there? 
praise the Lord, but thank God that they can begin to see that now you are appropriately using the name of God. Hallelujah. Amen. And so I appreciate you sharing that with me many years ago. I don't even know how long ago that was, but it really did. It meant something to me. It meant, it was just huge to me. You, you just don't know. And, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, we share things with each other. Uh, and uh, it, sometimes we, we really don't even realize how that we have helped people, how that we have impacted some people. Um, but I'd like to go a step further. And Friday night, we, we really shared about readying the church or getting the church ready, getting the church prepared, getting our minds right, uh, getting us to the realization that we operate in power and that we operate. And I love that song. Come on, how many of you could just give the Lord a shout of victory right now? Woo! Come on, come on, go away! Hallelujah! Amen. Come on, there's something happens when God's people are bold enough to shout for their God. Man, the walls of Jericho in your life will come crashing down. Can somebody shout, Amen? amen. You know, the impossibilities in your life become the possibilities in life. Amen. When you give God the glory and when you shout out, come on, in a power and authority. And so we learn that we have authority, but now today I'm going to go a step further and I want to talk about uh, the sanctification process in God. I want to talk about the fulfillments of the plans of God. We shared it just a little bit last night with the, with the leaders of, of three various churches and uh, so happy, so privileged to have that uh, opportunity. But I want to go a step further and I want to talk about and uh, preach a little message entitled Pretty Feet. <laughs> Pretty Feet. Uh, you know, it never ceases to amaze me. I wish I had a picture of some of the feet that I've seen lately. <laughs> I really do. Some of the ladies, you know, I've seen, uh, man, they get, the, you know, the well, manicures up here, but then they get these pedicures, right? And, uh, oh, my goodness, some ladies get all their little piggies, um, you know, just trim nicely and get them painted all kind of pretty. And I've even seen little toe rings. Rings, little rings, boop, on people's toes. Little ladies have a little toe ring on there. I said, oh, isn't that darling? Isn't that cute? Oh, look at that. That's a, that's a pretty good-looking set of feet right there. <laughs> I don't have such a pretty-looking set of feet, but some people got real pretty feet. Wow. And so the, our concept, our concept, <laughs> excuse me, I'm just trying to have a little fun, uh, but our concept sometimes of what a pretty foot is uh, is really not what God says a pretty foot is. And so I want to talk to you this morning about how to make your feet prettier. Glory to God. How many could use a little help? Glory to God. <laughs> and, uh, but I think that, I think when it comes right down to it, you know, the feet that the Lord admires uh, are a little different from those painted up little pretty piggies with little toe, little toe rings on there. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But I want to talk about the sending out. You know, Jesus uh, commanded his disciples and he said, Tarry ye in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And uh, when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you will be witnesses of me in Jerusalem and, and Judea and Samaria and then under the uttermost parts of the earth. And so, praise God. But the disciples had to be readied. The disciples had to be prepared. You know, they had spent all this time following Jesus Christ, but now the Lord speaks to them and he says, I'm going away. Hope you all learned what you're supposed to learn. Come on now. You know, he, <laughs> he didn't say that, but I'm sure they thought that. Oh, my God, you know, I'm not ready. Uh, you know, there's times in all of our lives, uh, you know, I didn't feel like I, well, I didn't even think it. I knew I was not ready uh, in of myself to begin to pastor when dad said he's going away. Uh, and I'm sure that's exactly how, you know, the disciples felt. And it made some of them angry. You know, change bothers some people. You know, if you get used to a certain regiment and you get used to a certain routine and then all of a sudden you get a, you get a curveball. You know, something comes your way, and man, it just knocks you for a loop and everything else. Some people are fearful. Some people, you know, react in different ways. But some people just get flat out mad. Uh, you know, Peter got so upset, you know, he denied the Lord. He said, man, this guy died on me. You know, this guy was crucified on me. You know, and he's kind of like playing the blame game with Jesus and saying, you know, I wanted him around. I wasn't really ready for him to leave yet. And so it caused him at that time of his life to have the greatest test of his faith that he'd ever experienced. And even Peter did not know what was in his heart, but Jesus knowing what was in his heart better than he did. And so there's going to be times in your life when offense is going to come. 
There's time in your life when change is going to come. And how you react to it, come on now, God will reveal. If he really loves you, come on, he's going he's gonna to reveal it to you. And you're going you're gonna to have to make some changes. You're going to have to deal with it. Come on now. And ultimately, I thank God that we know enough about the Lord to find uh, forgiveness, to find peace in our lives. And so with, with that in mind, with that in mind, I want to begin with John chapter 20 uh, this morning and begin reading in verse 16. And uh, Jesus, uh, here he is with Mary, and uh, uh, they're uh, in the garden, and Mary is there. And Jesus said unto her, uh, and uh, as she turned, she said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say master. And Jesus said unto her, touch me not, touch me not. For I'm not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I now ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had been or seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in, came right through the wall and stood right in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. I'm not a, I'm not a ghost. I'm not an evil spirit. Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed them, he proved to them, Look at my hands. Look at my side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, verse 21, I want to place special emphasis on this verse, peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, so send I you. Now, when the Son of God was delivered here through a virgin, when he was deposited here on, the, on this earth, when Jesus became aware that he was in flesh, and the word says that, that when Jesus found himself in the form of a servant, the word says that he humbled himself, come on now, and became a servant. And he became such a servant that he was obedient unto death and not just any quick, easy, in your, in your lazy boy death. Come on now, no. It was a death of the cross. It was crucifixion. But he agreed to that, and he gave himself to that. You know, and I ask a lot of people sometimes, what's your first memory? What's the earliest memory that you have as a baby, as a child? You know, most of the time they say that it's got to be probably between the three and four years old or some of the first actual memories that you can carry with you for the rest of your life. But the same thing happened, God in the flesh, when he realized, when he found, come on now, that yes, I am in the flesh. Yes, I am, come on now, in this vessel as my brethren are in their vessels. Come on now, that the Lord made a decision right then and there. He humbled himself and became obedient, praise God. Verse 22 continues, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained, but it doesn't say they're retained on them. See, what Jesus was actually saying, if you don't forgive people of their sins, then those sins are held accountable by you. Right. See, the first part of that says, he whosoever sins uh, uh, that you remit, they are remitted unto them. But then the second part of it says, if you're not willing to remit people's sins, you have to retain them. Somebody has to retain them. Come on, is anybody out there? And so we, we begin to realize the Word of God, and we begin to realize, you know, the, the power uh, that God has really entrusted into us. Uh, I heard an incredible, great quote the other day, and it goes this way. In order to be fulfilled, we must fulfill God's purpose for us. And a lot of people, because they don't feel fulfilled, the main reason is, well, are you fulfilling the call of God? Are you fulfilling the plans and the purposes of God? in yourself and so a lot of times we don't feel fulfilled or we think that something is blocking God uh, or somebody has done something and blocking the presence and the power of God from us when in reality come on now we are not completely obedient unto God so how can we feel fulfilled 
come on, is anybody out there? <laughs> Glory to God. Uh, but the, the man that gave that quote happened to be my son-in-law, Adam Walters. And I uh, appreciate Brother Adam for sharing that. And so I wrote that down. I thought, way to go, Adam. Man, that's good stuff. I'm going to write that down. And, uh, but, but nonetheless, uh, I want to begin now in, in Matthew chapter 10, uh, beginning in verse 5. And uh, I want to begin by uh, looking at some of the commands and some of the instructions that God gave his disciples. And uh, before we do that, I'd like you to turn and look at somebody and say, you're one of his disciples. You're, you're one of his disciples. Come on now. Now, don't, don't be like Peter, like a deer in the headlights. <laughs> no, oh, no, I'm not. Oh, no, no, I'm not. Pastor's a disciple. No, 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 no. No, we all are the disciples or sent ones of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. But uh, let's, let's just read a couple of verses. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, and it says, These twelve, ever say those twelve, those twelve, not the only ones, those twelve, Jesus sent forth and commanded them, not suggested to them, he commanded them saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. Now, this is one of the first commissions that God gave his disciples. This is not the great commission, but it's one of the first ones in the training process that God had for these new believers, for these new disciples. You know, you don't need to worry about God putting you into a situation you can't handle. The Lord would never do that to you. The Lord said, I'll never allow any temptation into your life than you are able to bear. But in every one of those tests, in every one of those trials, he said, I'll be sure and give you a way of escape. Come on, can somebody say, thank the Lord? Thank the Lord. So here we are. This is not the great commission that he left after he was glorified and, and gave unto his church. But no, this is, this is one of the commissions that he sent them on just to see how they were going to do. It was like, uh, it was like that practice run. You know, it was like that, okay, I'm just going to give you a little liberty. I'm going to give you a little freedom, and I'm going to see how you react to these new liberties. You know, parents oftentimes, we learn to do that with our children. We don't throw the full duty and responsibility on them. Come on, we feel like it's better for them to learn to ride a tricycle before we let them drive an automobile. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Other people say, thank God, praise the Lord. Uh, but nonetheless, no, see, it's a... It's a, it's a trial run, and so the Lord says, I'm going to limit the places you're allowed to go. I'm going to limit that. He says, you're not to mess with the Gentiles, and you're not to go to the Samaritans. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I want you to heal the sick. I want you to cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses nor script for your journey. Don't even bring two coats. Don't bring an extra pair of shoes nor yet stays. For the workman is worthy of his meat. And at an end to whatsoever city or town you shall enter, inquire who is worthy. And if there abide, uh, and there abide, till you go thence or leave that place. And when you come into a house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city." Now, I want to begin with some kind of serious stuff. I'm going to try to smile a little bit. Thank you, D. Uh, I, I'm going to try to do that. But, but how many of you know that, listen, the power of God is nothing to fool around with? Yeah. Listen, being saved is nothing to play around with. Come on, entering into the kingdom of God is, is not something that you can just take or leave. But when you come into the kingdom of God, come on now, it is serious business. Yeah. Serious business. Um, I realize at this particular time, I realize because I've, I know a couple of things about having authority passed on, not only to me, but taking that same authority and passing it on to another generation. Uh, I know that there's uh, wisdom in age. I know that there's uh, that gray hair uh, represents something other than uh, 
uh, just getting real old. Uh, no, it speaks of wisdom. It speaks of, everybody say, experience. 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 What does every employer want? Somebody with experience. Glory to God. And the young people are all saying, but how do I get that? Come on, give me a break. <laughs> Amen. But nonetheless, nonetheless, um, Jesus knew, listen to this. Jesus knew the Samaritans or the Gentiles were not ready to hear the gospel. They needed some more time. Also at times, all of us, I believe, are too quick to write some people off. Well, I, I tried to witness to them. I, I tried to do this. Well, you know what? Did you really pray and fast? Did you really seek God? And did you really ask the Lord, Lord, prepare their hearts and show me who is ready to receive my witness and ready to receive the gospel that I really would love to share to anyone. You know, I, I really believe that the Lord is training. He's it's in a training process, and he's looking at these young disciples, and he's saying, you know what? I don't believe they've got enough revelation yet. I don't believe that they have read John 3.16 yet. It wasn't even written yet. Come on, somebody say amen. I don't believe, come on now, that they had full revelation of the plans and the purposes of Jesus Christ. All they knew is that we're in school now, we're in church now, and we're following this Jesus around, and we're learning, and we're studying, and we're seeing things that we've never seen, we're hearing things we've never heard, but now all of a sudden the Lord says, okay, I've been doing some things, now I want you to start doing some things. Come on, it's like mom with that, that little one in the kitchen, whether it be a little guy or a little girl. I happen to believe in, in male chefs. I happen to believe it's not a bad thing for a man to be in the kitchen. Anybody out there? Come on now. Glory to God. Maybe I'm forward thinking. I don't know. Um, but, uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, she, she lets the little one at times, she's watching mom or he's watching mom do all these things, you know, or dad takes uh, uh, the children out and Brother Matt was sharing to give the boys the snippers and everything else and said, man, do the job. But dad, no, just, just do the job. Man, I loved hearing that. Give them duty, give them responsibility. Say, boys, try not to chop your fingers off, but here, here are the clippers. You've got to learn to use something. I'm not going to give you a chainsaw, by the way, yet. Come on, but I will give you a set of clippers. Anybody hear me? Mom's telling the little ones, come on now, you're, it's limited, but I'm going to let you mix the flour. I'm going to let you to, you know, to, to pour a little milk. I'm going to allow you to do some things. I'm not going to give it all to you right now. I'm not going to turn everything over to you, but I'm going to give you some things that you can begin to practice and you can begin because if you don't start small, you won't be any good when the whole thing gets on, gets on you. Amen? Amen? So here we have, he knew that the timing, Jesus did, he knew that the timing for everyone is not up to us. It is up to Jesus who knows the hearts of all people, of all people. Our job, duty, responsibility is just to be ready to share when the opportunity presents itself. Can somebody say amen? amen. You know, I'd love to hear, I want to just talk about Brother Paul a little bit. You know, he said, Brother Phil, he said, I, I would have loved to have been responsible for the salvation of every one of my children. And he said, when, when James really got a, a touch in the military, when James really got, you know, really got a, a touch from God, he said, I, I just kind of, well, well, thanks a lot, God. <laughs> I wanted to do that. Come on, I wanted to be the one. But, man, thank God for the ones that, you know, whose hearts were ready. You know, I want to thank God as a father, not as a pastor. No, as a father. For when every one of my four children came to that place in their life, when they had, were moved on by the Lord, I recognized it. And we knelt with them, and we prayed with them. And they prayed their way, prayed the sinner's prayer, and gave their heart and life, and surrendered it over to Jesus Christ. I want to thank God. Come on now that I had the honor and the privilege of being there with all of them, my wife and I, and baptized them in water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins, that they should walk in newness of life. And somebody wave your hand in victory. I do. I want to thank God for those beginnings. I want to thank God for those, those opportunities. But the Lord, and only the Lord, knew when their hearts would be ready. Come on now. And so we go from that, and now let's, let's look at how the apostles uh, responded. Acts chapter 13, verse 43 says, Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes, they followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy 
and spake against these things that were spoken by Paul, contradicting him and blaspheming against Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed, every say wax bold. They wax bold. And said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you Jews. What did Jesus command them to go to first? The lost sheep of the house of Israel to the Jews. Amen? And he says, but seeing that you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, now we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have sent thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be, come on now, uh, for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Now, I realize in Acts chapter 13 that it is after the Great Commission, but they still remembered the lesson when they were just beginning out. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Come on now. You know, as people are called into the ministry, all of their family may or may not have been saved. And I know that it's in the heart of every minister or every person, come on now, that you can never forget the lost people of your own house. Come on, can somebody lift your hand here tonight? We don't forget them this afternoon, rather. We don't forget them. We do not. How could we? But in the meantime, do we wait on going to the Gentiles or do we wait sharing the gospel with every creature? Do we hesitate and do we wait? No, we do not. So now the disciples being endued with power from on high, they've learned the lesson and they are now in a place of saying, you know what? We went to the Jews first in this nation. God's heart is for his people. And I, I believe it today more than ever before. Listen to me. God has not forgotten the Jewish race. God has not forgotten the Jewish people, but I believe that there's a revival coming and many Jews, blood-wise, are going to be swept into the kingdom of God. Come on, give the Lord a shout of victory, amen? Come on. But we read now when he says, okay, uh, verse 48, and when the Gentiles heard this, can you imagine being a Gentile? And can you imagine that most of the Gentiles at this time, they didn't even know that they could serve the Lord Jesus because, after all, they knew he was a Jew. And there was such a divide. There was such controversy between the Jew and the Gentile. You know, for thousands of years, there was only two races of people on the earth. There were the Jews, and then there were the Gentiles. Didn't matter if you were Irish, or didn't matter where you came from. Didn't matter if you're Scythian, Greek, or whatever, Roman. Didn't matter. You were lumped into one lump, and you were just flat out of luck, and you were lost without hope, and there was only one people that was select unto God. But can you imagine when the Jews and, uh, rejected him, can you imagine those Gentiles standing around and hearing the preaching of Paul and how their heart must have leaped and how they must have said, wow, this Jesus of Nazareth, this man full of power and might, this son of the Most High God has opened his arms up and has said that he wants us to be one of his children. Hallelujah. Can you imagine, come on now, what they must have been experiencing and when they heard the good news and said, listen, it doesn't matter about my birth. It doesn't matter about my upbringing. But all that matters now is this God Almighty, hallelujah, has embraced me and welcomed me to be a member of his family, to be joint heirs with that great man, Abraham, hallelujah. Come on, you godly Christian Jews out there. Give God a shout of praise and glory today and say, I want to thank God. Come on now that I have been asked to be a part of the family of God. Hallelujah. My praise the Lord. Isn't that good? I, I, could, I could, man, I could say a lot more. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. So the choice really isn't up to us. The choice is up to God. Come on, we understand that without faith it's impossible. We understand that without receiving the initial grace of God that it's impossible to enter the kingdom. But do you realize it's impossible for man to just pick and choose if he's going to be a part of Jesus or not? Yeah. You've got to be called of God. Amen. The word just simply says, make your calling and your election sure. How do we make it sure? We respond. We bow our knee. We pray the sinner's prayer. Come on now, we get water baptized, we get filled with the Holy Ghost. Come on, is anybody out there? 
That's making your calling and your election sure. But make no mistake, you can't just volunteer. As a matter of fact, in the ministry, God uses no volunteers or usurpers in the kingdom. You've got to be called of God. Come on now. I don't care what it is in the church, cleaning the toilets or straightening the chairs. I want somebody that's called of God to get the job done. <laughs> Come on, is anybody out there? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. And so we begin to realize that this, it really is, it's, it's pretty serious, pretty serious. And so the word of the Lord was published throughout the region. The Gentiles exploded. The Gentiles were just going crazy and sharing it with everybody. And they had heard the good news, and they're going to their neighbors. They're going to their family and saying, we can be saved. We can be saved. Come on now. We, we, can, we can be followers, disciples of this incredible miracle maker. And so they were, they were sharing the word of God. They were preaching like nobody else, man. And verse 50 says, But the Jews <laughs> stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. Wow, can you believe that? Some people really do. If they don't get their way, they don't want anybody saved. They don't want anybody blessed. I'm just going to be miserable, and I kind of want everybody else to be miserable too. <laughs> oh, dear, God hasn't called us unto misery. He's called us unto love, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Come on, can somebody say amen? amen? Praise the Lord. But then verse 51 says, But they shook off the dust of their feast against them and came unto Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. You know, this is so real. I'm just not preaching some empty stuff here. I said the power of God is real. Look at somebody say, the power of God, power of God is real, is real. This thing works. I heard a story a number of years ago that my father, my father told me a lot of stories about my grandmother. I really didn't know my grandmother. She came and, and lived with us, my grandmother Crandall. Uh, as did my grandmother Watchers on my mother's side. They both lived with us for a short period of time, and so that was an opportunity in my life to get to know a mighty woman of God. Man, she began to preach the gospel when women were not allowed to pre be preachers. Come on now. She really did. And uh, my, I heard my father always say, he said, listen, if you don't believe in a woman carrying the word, he says, you don't believe in Mary. She carried the womb. Come on, carried that word in her womb for nine months. Come on, is anybody out there? Just wave your hand in victory, ladies. <laughs> Glory to God. You can carry the word. As a matter of fact, you should be carrying the word. Amen? Praise God. But nonetheless, they told me one particular story. And he said, your grandmother walked in such power and authority, but she was the most contented and the most humble woman that most people had ever met. Spent most of her time simply in prayer and studying God's word. Lord directed her to go to this particular city, and as she was there, uh, they took her to uh, this, this particular house. And so when the people had heard uh, the reputation, but when they met Grandmother Crandall, she had red hair, and, uh, and she weighed about 200 pounds, and uh, by that time, she's up, she's up about 70 years old. And when she went into their home and began to preach Jesus Christ in their home, they couldn't get past the red-haired woman part. And they got upset, and they got kind of angry, and they just clammed up, folded their arms, and asked her to please leave their home. Asked her to leave their home. So dad tells this story. He said, Grandma left the home, and as she gathered her, her little coat, she gathered her little women wore hats, put her little, little hat on, and as she stepped out, little umbrella hanging on her arm, wasn't Mary Poppins, but something kind of like that, maybe. Uh, but she stepped out on the porch, and she said, when she stepped out on the front porch of these people's home, she said, her feet went crazy. She said, my feet begin to shake, and they begin to tremble, and they begin to dance. And she said, I'm standing there. I've got no control over this. And said, my feet begin to violently dance and to shake on that front porch. And she didn't know what was going on. She was trying to get her balance and everything else. And so as she walked off, the Lord just spoke to her and said, don't worry. You have been obedient unto me. I will deal with those who have refused me. Not Grandmother Crandall have refused the word of God. Sometimes we can't pick or choose who's going to bring the right message at the right time to us. 
Come on now, I read about this guy named Balaam. Come on now. God did speak to him through a jackass because he was one. Anybody out there? Come on now. So sometimes we can't pick or choose. But the story goes that less than a month later, this particular family was traveling down the highway. And they happened, just, just happened, if you believe in, in, in chance happenings, they hit head on with another car. And the other car happened to be filled with other of their family members. Everybody in both vehicles was instantly killed. Now, Dad didn't tell me that story to scare me, but it did. Come on now. But he told it to me as I'm telling it to you, because I don't believe in getting a spirit of fear on us. Come on, anybody out there? But I do believe in fear and reverence to Almighty God. And I do believe, come on now, that in order to see great things, we've got to believe great things. Come on, is anybody out there? In order for God to work uh, through us, God must work in us and in us. And so as she believed in the power of God, she saw many blind eyes open, many cripples healed. She would travel at times with Catherine Kuhlman. She would travel sometimes with Amy Simple McPherson. And there were some incredible stories uh, uh, that this woman tells in those days when it wasn't really popular for, for women to do these things. But I want to continue uh, just a, a little bit here. And uh, let's change gears just a, just a little, very little bit and go to Ephesians chapter 6 and beginning of verse 12, which plainly declares the word of the Lord for us this morning. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Don't get mad at people. Get mad at the devil. Right. Somebody say amen. I said don't get mad at people. Get mad at the devil. Come on, amen? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, just to stand. Stand therefore, verse 14, with your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. Everybody say the gospel of peace. Wow. Not the gospel of punishment. Come on. The gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, and watching thereunto all perseverance and supplication Every say, for all saints. For all saints. Look at somebody and say, shod your feet. Shod your feet with a preparation of the gospel of peace. Of peace. Praise God. John 13, verse 3 continues. And I want to look at two incredible examples here. And we're going to try to wrap this up. We're a little over halfway through just to give somebody an idea where we're headed this morning. But John chapter 13, verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and would return to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his outer garments, and he took a towel and girded himself. And in those days, the men would take their, 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 their gown or their, their robe that they wore, and they would actually take it and pull it up and, and tie it. It would turn, look more like a pair of pants uh, because it's hard to work. How many people know it's hard to work in a skirt? Yeah, yeah, some of you do. I don't, but they knew. They knew. My, how the apparel has changed. Wow, wow, praise God. But anyhow, well, that's another message. But my goodness. And so here's Jesus. And he, and, he, and he girds up himself. And uh, it says that after he poureth water in the basin, listen, and began to wash what part of the disciples? The feet. And to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. And Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. 
Jesus answered him and said, listen, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said unto him, he that is washed needeth not to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. Peter, you are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet, and had taken his garments, and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? You call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, so ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you should do it as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that has sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye that do them. Do you realize that when Jesus was washing their feet, this representing the cleansing of the word, the cleansing of the word, bringing the righteousness of the gospel into their personal testimony. Somebody wave your hand in victory today. Wow. Jesus, here's Jesus washing their feet. It was a custom of the day. It was a very necessary and a very, very needful thing. You wore sandals in the heat, in the 90 degree heat, and walked in the dust and dirt all day long and worked when you got home at night. You know, you didn't drive your automobile around every day. No, you were apt to walk 10, 20 miles in a day. When you got home, man, them dogs is barking. Somebody say amen. Come on now. So washing the feet was a great thing, but Jesus said, no, you don't understand what I'm doing here. You don't understand what I'm doing here. And you're not going to realize what I've done until after I'm gone, as a matter of fact. Until you begin to obey my word, until you begin to carry the gospel, and as you begin to take my character and nature to the four corners of this earth, then you'll begin to comprehend and you'll begin to understand the fullness and revelation of why I'm washing your feet and why I must begin with your feet. You know, the word of God cannot be perverted. The word of God cannot be tainted. It cannot be soiled by flesh, by ambitions, come on, by any other thing. But the word of God, listen to me, will stand on its own merit. Can somebody say amen? amen. And what he was telling Peter is that, listen, he said, Peter, uh, I, I know what's in your heart, but he said, I never stopped you from sharing the gospel, not one time. Jesus said, listen, I knew you have faults. I knew you had failures, but I wanted to see if you were just going to obey me. I just wanted to see. How many of you know that this man, his whole life with Christ began by a simple obedience? Come on, Jesus walks up and says, hey, sir, hey, buddy, can I use your fishing boat? Bring your fishing boat over. Can I use your boat? He could have said, no way. You're not going to mess with my livelihood. Yeah. Come on, what if some stranger walked up to one of you guys and said, hey, I want to borrow your snap-on tool set? <laughs> Come on. Can I, can I drive your 65 Chevelle? Can you pull your 65 Chevelle? I own one. Can I pull your, come on, can I, can I and I, hey, wait, whoa, whoa, wait. But you know, something on the inside of him, he said yes to Jesus. But sure. And not only that, but he's a professional. He's a professional at his, at his, uh, at his vocation. And so now Jesus says, oh, by, by the way, he said, oh, by the way, he said, Try fishing on this side of the boat. Now, how many of us would have got plum insulted and said, you're telling me how to do my job and I'm a professional? But what did he do? He did it. He simply obeyed. You see, God is looking for just your simple obedience. Leave the power thing. Leave that up to God. Can somebody just lift your hand? Just obey God. Brother Phil, I, I, I can't, Dad used to always say it, I can't heal the, uh, the, uh, a fly of a headache. <laughs> No, but Jesus can. Come on, Lord tells you to lay hands on somebody. Come on now, why don't you just begin to practice it? Well, I'm afraid of being wrong. Well, that's okay. Well, that's okay. You have been wrong before. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, you poor thing. Oh, you poor person. Come on now. Oh, I don't want to look bad. Oh, you've looked real bad before. Yeah. Come on, what's the big deal? Come on, have you seen me in the morning? Come on, is anybody out there? But what the Lord is looking for, and he's saying, listen, you just obey me and let me worry about the other. Right. 
Keep your heart right. Keep your feet clean. Come on, is anybody out there? Stay in my righteousness. You know what a righteousness equates to? Obedience to the command of God. We can, listen, we can volunteer to go to the far end of the earth and to work for the rest of our lives free of charge for somebody. And if God didn't tell us to do it, and if God ain't in it, listen, it will not be accounted unto you for righteousness sake. You can cast out devils. You can preach in his name. You can do the, all these things. But if God ain't telling you to do it, come on now, it's not going to be a credit to your righteousness. Come on, somebody wave your hand in victory. I'm, hope, I'm trying to get some of you off the hook. Come on. You know, you can get a little happy. Come on now. You know, you can begin brand new and fresh this morning. Pastors will love it. Come on, anybody out there? You begin begin today and say, okay, yeah, I'm just going to lay some things aside. And I'm just going to begin to get real obedient unto God. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Wow. Luke chapter 7, verse 37 says, Behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner. Everybody say, she's a sinner. When she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster box of anointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and then wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself saying, this man, if he really was a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman that is that toucheth him for she is a sinner. Jesus said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto you. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed him 500 pence, the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him the most? Simon answered, said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most and he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. Wow. You know, that's why it behooves us never to forget what and how much God has forgiven us for. Come on. Come on. When we get to a place where we forget that we stood right where a lot of sinners stand one day. Come on. It doesn't matter how much we've done. doesn't matter what we've done. Come on now. Simple matter is God forgave the entire world. Come on, is anybody out there? But it just seems like that some people feel like, they just feel like God forgave them for a lot of things. And they express that. They express that. They asked one of the pastors of one of the largest churches in California one time, said, uh, why do you get so excited over Jesus? You know, why do you jump around and dance and shout and do all these things? And he said, well, he said, I, I guess it's because, man, you, you didn't know me before I saved. He said, I guess you didn't know what kind of person I was before Jesus got a hold of my life. And he said, I'm the happiest man in the world. He said, I think I've been forgiven of more stuff than anybody else in this entire world. And so he said, excuse me if I get a little happy about that. Come on, should somebody get a little happy and give the Lord a little hand clap here today? <laughs> Come on. Amen. Praise the Lord. Wow. But here we have, here we have. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered into your house. You gave us me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gave us me no kiss, but this woman, since the time that I came in, have not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this man that forgives sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. You know, my Jesus had dusty feet. They weren't so pretty to the world standards. But my Jesus had dusty feet. Why? 
because it is his will that none should perish. And he was getting ready to die for the sins of the whole world. I know he loves us. Not to have to kick off the dust against anyone. And as a matter of fact, we need to pray for the Lord to send us to the humanity or the dust of this world. Romans 10 verse 9 says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and when the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. There's no difference between the Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, everybody say, shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Or how shall they hear without a preacher? Verse 15, and how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, everybody say this with me, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. Just lift your hands unto the Lord. We are God's servants, and we are to bring, everybody say, glad tidings of good things. Verse 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Church, I'm not getting down. I'm not getting down on feeding the hungry, clothing the naked. I'm not getting down on those things. I'm not getting down on visiting the prisoners. The word says that if you visit the fatherless and you do these things, so that's, that's, that's holiness, that's good. But listen to me. If you have never shared the gospel with your mouth, how then do we expect faith to arise in their hearts? Some people say, well, I, I'm not good at speaking or I'm not good at talking. Well, well, wait a minute. You may not be. Our children were not good at speaking and talking. Our son Paul was one of the shyest little guys you have ever seen in your life, but we didn't allow him to remain that way. Somebody come in that house, my word, he embarrassed my wife to death one time. She's wearing this long skirt, and somebody came in the house. Well, guess what Paul does? He climbs under her skirt, and he's under there with the rest of her. And she's pushing, what in the world's wrong with this boy? Oh, my word. He, either that or he'd go hide under the couch. Wouldn't say a word. But listen, we didn't allow him to remain that way. By degree, by degree, today, he's a great sergeant in the sheriff's department there in Franklin County, a leader of men. He was voted as one of the best uh, uh, prison uh, guards for a three-year straight because he treated the prisoners with respect, and so therefore they respected him. <clears throat> he has yet to today ever to even say the word S-H-U-T-U-P. I'm not even allowed to say it. My wife will get me. We're not allowed to use those terms because many of these prisoners, the only thing they have heard in life are those words. They're belittled, they're slandered, they're put down, and they don't need somebody else in their life to continue the very thing that got them in the trouble that they are in. Somebody wave your hand. Come on. We serve a good God. Can somebody say amen? amen. Praise God. How should they preach except they be sent? As is written, how beautiful are the feet of them. I'm going to close with this, these last few thoughts. Genesis chapter 2 verse 4 says, These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the heaven and the earth and every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it even grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground 
and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. You know, I heard somebody say one time that, you know what, we're not even made from dirt. Dirt's worth something. Isn't that pile of topsoil out there you said it's worth something? Dirt has value. You can grow stuff. How about dust? How many of you collect the dust when you dust the house? <laughs> Come on, you keep it in a big bag say, wow, look at me. How much dust have you got? <laughs> I would say it's worthless. But what made it of great value? God Almighty breathed the breath of life into you, into me. Doesn't matter how you came into the world. Doesn't matter who your parents were. Doesn't mean anything else. I hope to God that sometime during your life you're going to realize that you were in the mind of God before you were ever in your mother's womb. Long before the foundation of the world, Christ died for you. Come on, I wish somebody would hear me this morning. Come on, I wish somebody would hear me this morning. That God breathed the breath of life into your worthless corpse. You became in his sight and his eyes, his beloved and his precious one. Not just me, not just you. The whole earth. The whole earth, everyone out there. As we walk among the humanity of this world, we will get dust on our feet. Wow. There's an old saying that goes, roll up your sleeves and get your hands dirty. But I say, it's time to roll up your pant legs and get your feet dirty. I thank the Lord for two kinds of dirty feet or dusty feet in my life. Number one, those people who had patience with me and number two, those that received me. In the shape that I was in, they received me. Come on. Just quickly, uh, a couple of years ago, honey, I don't know exactly how many years ago the funeral was now. Maybe a, has it been a little over a year ago for, for Susan's mama, for your... Right, right out of the middle of the year. Just a little over a year. Well, we were asked through circumstances. Gina, my wife, was gone in and out of foster care most of her entire life. When I met her, she was in a foster home and um, hadn't seen either of her parents for a lot of years. And so at that time, at that time, she had a, a burden. And after we married, she began to, she, she began to seek out the other siblings in her home and her family members because God put a real burden on her to share with them how God had rescued her, how God had begun to bless her. God had given her family what she never had. And this woman got a hold of me, her, her love for people and her getting a hold of family members. I mean, it just tore me all to pieces. And so I'm ministering with her. I'm, I'm encouraging her on. Man, I'm behind her. Go for it. Let's do it. Let's travel. Let's do some things. Call and meet people and do it. And absolutely, it's going on. And so... Uh, she got acquainted with a uh, half-sister she never knew she had and some other family members and began a great relationship. And so they didn't have a pastor. And so when little mama died, little mama died, they said, Gina, do you think Philip would be willing to come down and preach mama's funeral? We said, yes, we will. Yes, of course we will. You're our family now. So I went down as I preached that funeral. I was preaching about eternal security, and the greatest insurance policy that anybody could ever have. How that trusting in the Lord and putting your life in his hands will change your life and will bring such peace and security in your life. Little did I know it, but God's working on Brian over here, her son-in-law. I don't say it prideful or boastful, but the next day, here we are. And Mama, she's gone, she's buried now, but we're standing in her front yard and we're going to pack a few things up and go over some memories. And I could see that God was working on this big man's heart, way taller, way bigger than I am. I begin to share how that God forgave me for all the junk that I'm guilty of and all the terrible things and the attitudes and everything else that I grew up with in my life in a godly home. Come on, if there's a black sheep, listen, you're looking at the guy in the Crandall's. 
But I begin to share what God has done, and I watch his heart. I watch this man's heart begin to break. And I said, Brian, buddy, I said, would, would you like to pray with me right now and accept Jesus Christ? Have your sins forgiven and make him Lord of your life. Without hesitation, he grabbed a hold of me, picked me right up off my feet, and he said, yes, Phil. Yes, Phil, he said, I've been waiting. He said, at that funeral, he said, I felt like I was floating on air. He said, as you were preaching, he said, I had never felt anything like it in my life. He said, I felt like I was floating in air, and he said, I was just kind of floating up in your direction. He said, I didn't know what was going on, but he said, now I know what was going on. We joined and prayed together, and he got gloriously saved right there in that front yard. Praise God. Come on, let's give the Lord a shout of victory. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. And also, this will be my last story. But I grew up, I grew up, went to high school with a young woman. Can I have another tissue, sweetheart? I grew up, went to high school with a, with a lovely young, young lady. And at that time, thank you, Brother Paul. At that time, her name was Pamela Rohr. And um, she and her brother were both adopted. Their um, adoptive parents could not have children, and so they adopted little baby Pamela and adopted her brother Doug. Well, over the course of years, I got to know Pam. I introduced her to my best friend. I was her best man at their wedding, and Scott, her husband, introduced my wife and I, and he was my best man at our wedding. So you can understand we've been lifelong friends. One good turn deserves another. Glory to God. <laughs> but nonetheless, um, I knew Doug. I admired Doug. But he turned away from the Lord about 20 years of age. Started going his own way, and he got let bitterness creep into his heart. And Doug became one of the most bitter, angry people I've ever seen in my life. On drugs and alcohol. He's an incredible businessman. I loved the guy. I didn't love the life he was leading, but man, I always liked Doug. And I always would tell him that. And his wife was wonderful. Man, they drove motorcycles. He had a great business. He was a man's man and did all this stuff. So I remember over all these years, we just happened to be over at his place. And when I got ready to leave, I walked over and I said, I said, Doug, I said, I, I just can't leave without telling you. I said, buddy, I think about you often. And I said, I'm praying for you. And he goes, oh, yeah, well, that, that explains why I've been having such a miserable day. <laughs> and I laughed. I said, Doug, that's funny. I said, Doug, that's funny. You can't let stuff, people like that bother you. Yeah. Come on, you can't pick up their offense. Right. I laughed it off. About, about two weeks later, three weeks later, Doug was still in my heart. One Sunday morning, I'm out walking, as I always do on Sunday mornings today, I went all the way down to Cheddar's and back and all the way around the other motels and back and I'm out in the beautiful Pennsylvania weather. Glory to God. You guys are so blessed. But anyhow, here I'm enjoying the outdoors and I was that day and Doug was on my heart. I was walking, never forget, I was walking up through the parking lot of our church. I'd been down visiting dad and mom's graves and I was walking up through the parking lot and how many of you know that when you begin to pray in the Holy Ghost, you, you'll pray in the Holy Ghost for a little while, but then you pray with your understanding and you pray the interpretation of what God's been putting on your heart. Right. Right. So I'm praying in tongues a little bit, praying in the Holy Ghost, and all of a sudden the interpretation comes out. My heart begins to break and I begin to weep. I begin to say, oh God, oh God, this man is so hard, but Lord, if you'll touch his heart, if I have to drive through the hours of the night, I will be at his side and I will pray with Doug Roar. I knew how hard he was. He scared my kids to death. I think it was Paul or one of them. Mark, little Mark. Mark came up there, and, and we went over to see Doug, and he'd let us hog hunt down in his orange grove sometimes. And Mark walked up there, and he's meeting this new man. He's trying to be respectful, and he's not that. He's, what, 13, 14, littler than that. And so Mark walks up, and Doug War looks at him and goes, Huh, I can tell you're... you're you belong to Phil, you're one of Phil Crandall's sons, and you're as ugly as your old man. And little Mark, little Mark, was like, oh, 
my God, he was rough. I mean, this guy was rough. He was rough looking. He was in every say intimidating. <laughs> well, here I am praying. Here I am praying. So the Spirit of God lifted. I went on home. And the minute I walked in the door, my wife said, Philip, Pamela just called unexpectedly. She doesn't ever call on Sunday morning. She told me that Doug's in trouble. Doug's got problems. She said, I said, Doug, do you want one of your cousins who was a minister? He's a, they're all former Mennonite people. He said, do you want, do you want uh, your cousin to come over? He's a pastor now. Would you, would you allow him to come over and pray for you? He said, no, I ain't allowing no preacher to come pray for me. But he said, I will listen to Phil Crandall. Fifteen minutes later, fifteen minutes later, within 24 hours, come on now, I was in Bradenton, Florida. I was halfway out where he lives, almost to Arcadia, way out in the boonies, nothing but rattlesnakes and alligators out there. And I was on my knees with Doug Lohr as he wept his way through and begged God to forgive him of his sins. And he asked that day, asked Jesus Christ to come into his life and be his Lord and be his God. The impossible had become possible. This unreachable, people had, so many people had given up on Doug Lohr. So many people have said, he's too mean, he's done too much, he's gone too far. He should have known better. He's raised in a godly home. Parents that didn't even know him, they embraced him and adopted him and brought him into their home and he hates them. He hates God, he hates anything. It was less than a year later, I got another phone call. The Doug died. We don't have any other pastors. Would you please come down and preach the funeral? And I said, absolutely. No hesitation, I will be there. And I found myself a few days later back in Bradenton, Florida. And this time there was about from 75 to 100 of the most unbelievably wicked and rough, we call them rednecks in Florida. Florida crackers, I'm telling you what. <laughs> scary bunch of people. The four-wheel drive trucks were lined up down the parking lots. Come on now beer cans, come on now, everything going on, people afraid of them, and here they are packed into this funeral home. And I was given the opportunity that day to announce to each and every one of them, you see this man, you see the, the body that's left of Doug Lohr today. I want to tell all of you, and I told them, I said, I want to tell all of you that less than a year before now, I knelt with this man. And he asked Jesus Christ to forgive him and asked Jesus to be the Lord of his life. And I said, today, as I'm talking with you, he is in the presence of Almighty Hallelujah. God today. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Church, you can't make this stuff happen. You can't make it up. You can't produce this. But if you'll simply be willing to God, if you'll silly, simply be willing to listen and to heed God and say, Lord, Show me the open hearts, God. I'm available. I'm willing, Lord. Yes, we need to do good things for people, but don't ever fail to throw in a scripture verse every once in a while. Here, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, by the word of the Lord. You don't have to memorize half the Bible, but if you know enough, when God opens the door, opens the heart, and you have the honor and the rare privilege of being there, come on now, it will change your life. Amen. And more importantly, it'll change their life. Amen. It'll change their life. Yes. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Wow. When we see a salvation... And when we stomp on his head, listen, we know the devil smells defeat. 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 Come on, let's stand together here today. Come on, let's give the Lord a shout of victory. Amen.
Amen. Praise the Lord. Don't forget John chapter 20, verse 21. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Would you lift your hand, please? Would you be willing? Would you be a willing to just lift your hand tonight, today? I have one need another tissue. Here, I got one. Never mind. I got one. Whoo, this thing got on me. Hope it's getting on you today. In case you ever wondered, in case you ever wondered, as your hand is lifted, the Lord Jesus commissions you this moment, this day, to go forth and to preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. But you receive the commissioning of the Lord today. As God moves on your heart, and as I know God is moving on your spirit right now, don't let fear stop you any longer from simply saying yes to God. God needs you people everywhere that you live, everywhere that you work, every person you know, God needs you to be right there in his stead. As he was sent of the Father, Jesus is now sending you, 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 everyone in this room. You are being commissioned by the word of the Lord today. Let faith arise in your heart. Let the boldness of God, I didn't say the anger, I, I, I didn't say no, no, the threats, no, none of that. Everybody say the good news. The good news. Let the good news out of your mouth. Let the good news come on now, be a part of your life and share the good news with everyone that you possibly can. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise Lord. God bless you today. Give your pastors a good hand. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. We said last week we are to bear his name, wear his name, and share his name. Amen. I'm just thinking of the, the outreaches going on this summer here at this church, the playground, the, the, the wedding or the, uh, the marriage seminar, the movie nights, the VBS, the um, community day. I said, Lord, let that playground be filled with the speaking of your word. They don't need just a playground. They don't need just food. They don't need just toys. They don't need the community needs your word. Anoint us to share your word, each and every one of us. Amen. And not just the actions here, but our actions there outside of this property in our workplaces. Lord, fill our mouths with your spoken word. We must live it, but we must tell it. Amen. Hallelujah. How many, how many appreciate the word today? Thank you so much for being here, celebrating with us. Love on our pastors today and join us in the family room next door. Guys, you've been to service. Now go be the church in Jesus' name. We love you.